Welcome to Level with Emily. This is music by Mike Rasnick for Away, the survival series. In this game, you control a sugar glider as he's trying to make his way to safety in a new world. And as you work your way through the world, there's narration, just like a nature documentary, and you learn all about these little tiny sugar gliders, these little creatures. Uh, Mike has composed for nature documentaries before, like Planet Earth 2, and he wrote absolutely beautiful, soaring music to accompany the sugar glider's journey. And if you buy the Away soundtrack on Bandcamp, Mike is giving all proceeds of that to the Audubon Society, which is an organization dedicated to the protection of birds. So be sure to visit Mike Rasnick on Bandcamp for the Away, the Survival Series soundtrack. It's called Away, the Survival Series. Um, it's, uh, it was developed by a group of guys in uh, Montreal. Originally, it was a virtual reality experience um, where you played a, a bearded vulture, sort of like, you know, flying through like cliffs and valleys and then ending up in like a forest fire and escaping a volcano and all this stuff. And so, um, so when I met them, this was going to be like my first virtual reality game. And I put on, you know, put on the virtual reality set and, and experienced, you know, sort of sitting on, on the floor, almost like an, an ant in a forest, looking up at a giant deer that looked like the Empire State Building, basically, from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was just so excited. I mean, the, the first thing for me was, okay, I get to, you know, explore music where I'm like flying in the clouds or, you know, or soaring over, you know, cliffs. And that was just so exciting to me. And in my past, first of all, you know, I got my um, degree from college um, at UC Santa Cruz in environmental studies. Um, I did a thesis on um, alternatives to pesticides for artichokes. And, and somehow I found myself, you know, later in computers and then moving into, you know, writing music and, and really writing music for games, um, which I did a ton of. And along the way, when I started writing like TV music, I was working on some of those Discovery Channel shows that were, you know, like nature documentary programs following either lions in Africa or things like that. And, and then I got to work on Discovery Channel's Life, which Oprah Winfrey narrated so beautifully, and, and then even do a little bit of work on Planet Earth too. And so it was probably the reason that I got the project in the first place. As soon as I mentioned that to the guys when I met them, they were like, oh, you're exactly what we're looking for. You're hired. And it was that easy, but it was, but I think it was really like kind of a match made in heaven though. So um, so it was just about, you know, finding the right sound for, uh, for, for these experiences. And I think it's, it's a very immersive kind of score. It's, it's not one of those, uh, um, soundtracks that kind of jumps at you, you know, with big themes and is like, you know, pulls you right in. But I think if you give it a chance, it, it sort of, it, it, it allows for, for a certain experience. And I could see that, you know, maybe like, you know, walking through a park or, or taking some time to sort of like slow down and, you know, not be viewing TikTok videos um, <laughs> that, that, that you might actually really get into it. We recorded, you know, some of uh, some some great, you know, orchestras um, in Budapest with the forty string players and um, and some of Hollywood's finest um, woodwind players, Sarah Andin on flute, you know, playing both like bass flutes and and alto yes. flutes, regular and 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 some other great musicians as well. And then and then myself, I mean, I try to also take some of the soundscapes and really, you know, turn sounds upside down by um, you know yeah. time stretching pianos and. And uh, bowing everything from uh, you know guitars to uh, um, hammered dulcimers and you know violins, of course, and then and then processing those sounds and really trying to come up with a an original sounding but organic soundscape. You know, maybe closer to what um, you know a marsupial or a bird might be <laughs> like listening to <laughs> while they're on their own little adventures, which you know certainly wouldn't be a living room with a piano in it. So. <laughs> Well, so when did it change from the bearded vulture to the sugar glider then? They had uh, an initial investment from, um, from the Canadian um, government and um, uh, the CMF, I think, something like that. So they were sort of doing this five minute experience and they were going to sort of call it different chapters. And, you know, each chapter is going to feature a different animal. And at a certain yeah. point, 
they they kind of decided that um, you know virtual reality was maybe like not as big as you know there was a little moment where everyone was like oh virtual reality is gonna be huge and then all of a sudden it was like it was still there but it wasn't quite you know as big so they were like let's take this and and do like a five hour game or something and 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 they and they and then they changed the character for this was now chapter two which was the um, which was the sugar glider. So they were like, well, so somehow they discovered the sugar glider, which is a marsupial mostly located in Australia. And, uh, and, and, and the game ended up being sort of like a um, post-apocalyptic experience, you know, in, in kind of, I guess, like a Canadian Montreal based, you know, area and uh, where animals had taken back over and, and sure enough, there's sugar gliders hanging around and, <laughs> and flying and, you know, having their own adventures and stuff. So we did kind of like the epic sugar glider experience, like the, the first, the first uh, marsupial <laughs> um, <laughs> gameplay experience. Uh, and that was, that was chapter two. So it, you know, it started out with, um, with just kind of following this marsupial, like, you know, running around and jumping over waterfalls and, and, you know, gliding through trees and stuff. And, and again, it was just, you know, it was just a, a beautiful way to sort of explore a musical experience around, yeah. around a little animal. And, um, you know, and, and it had to be sort of, you know, both like very, you know, broad sounding, but also, you know, an intimate kind of experiences at the same time. I mean, it's like this little tiny, cute little animal, which is calling, following its sister and its mother. And then uh, as it happens in nature, good things happen and bad things happen. And there's, you know, fights to be fought and survival and all that. So, um, you know, so so it was just kind of about um, creating that that experience. mentioned the orchestra in Budapest, Budapest, as I was taught uh-huh. to say in classical radio, Budapest. Uh, you talked about the, the orchestra from there, and, and it really is, is amazing. And, but then I do love that there's the electronic elements that you combined as well, and we'll talk about those. But, but the orchestra, tell me about working with them, because it's just really beautiful. It's always such a fantastic experience, and uh, and and I think for for this project, it was just creating like the soaring kind of sounds and the sort of lushness that um, that you can get from live strings. And I guess what happened was I was you know helping out the orchestrator a little bit for um, the Planet Earth score, and I was playing different different music cues from that and. And one of my uh, friends came to town and I was kind of showing them what, you know, a way looked like. And, and, and I always love the experience of having a, another pair of ears in the room and then just seeing how they react to, to, to listening to something because it always informs me so much. Like, so I have like little like light bulb moments when I, when I see, or, he, you know, when I can see what other people are reacting to, whether it's my music or other music and, and I just started like playing some music behind this, you know, well, they probably didn't even notice I was doing it, but, but there was this moment when, when, when I could hear the, the orchestra just kind of um, swell up like, Daddy, like this um, and, and, and that change. And then all of a sudden, like my friend's fiance was like, Oh, wow, that's incredible. And it was like, she said it. And then I was like, Oh, well, that's the sound that I was looking for. <laughs> and, and then I just like went and, you know, pulled in that, that orchestral, you know, this, the stack of how the strings were working and, and then wrote a little song around that. And uh, which, you know, ends up being, it's very slow. It's like three minutes long, but, but it worked perfect. I mean, it was like, it, it, there was no revisions that were needed. It all happened in the right time. And, and then, and then of course the next step is, recording it with the orchestra and it was just so I don't know they played it beautifully it was really really quite quite nice to experience that and then putting you know and then putting some sampled strings behind it to beef it up and adding some short strings in there and some little flutes and chalests and you know just things to sort of liven it up and give it a little bit more color and a little more movement but um but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's one of my favorite things to be able to do that. And it doesn't have to be music that's always like really difficult to play, but it can, it, but, but the musicians can do something that, that certainly like samples can't when you're trying to connect something that's getting louder and quieter and has, you know, and, and has certain kinds of legato motion and that sort of thing.
you can record a sound in a closet and make it sound like you did it in a cathedral, right? Just adding reverb can make something small sound very big. And I know that that's one way that composers create a sense of space and openness. But you can also do that with range, right? With like having strings up high and strings down low and creating this vastness. And and I really felt that too through through the music. So will you talk a little bit about that? Um, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think definitely creating space is really, really important. I mean, there are some tricks, I think in cinematic music, uh, you can do things like, um, like mid side processing where you're kind of like stretching the range of, (laughs) of of the audio file, basically. So you're hearing it more on the far left and right. So, I mean, I probably played around with some tricks like that, but You know, I think when you're recording an orchestra, just using the right microphones and the right amounts of stuff. uh, I I think from, you know, I write a lot of trailer music and cinematic music, which, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, production that goes into it. And I think finding ways for the music to breathe um, in the frequency range, as well as the way it's recorded are are really important things, making sure there is not buildup in the low end. And uh, and 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 I've had a, a lot of uh, opportunity to experiment with that. But uh, so, I mean, so I certainly, you know, tried to, to do some of that stuff. Uh, but I think that, but but I think that in this sense, you know, the orchestra sounded really clean. It was really well done, and and it wasn't that hard to really make make it sound good. I I did add like the initial samples that I recorded with with the string orchestra. I did add that back in because it just sounded and maybe it just sounded a little more familiar to the way I often hear things from media music. So it's probably just a reaction to that. But but definitely you know, having the live flute player just doing, blah, 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 you know, those little inflections of stuff that sort of pop through. And then, and then there was the, and then I actually had a sampled strings as well, which were the short strings, which usually take a lot longer to record, but they were really simple parts where they were kind of, uh, I think it was a, uh, uh, maybe a two part cello and one part viola, just going like, you know, just kind of, and it's kind of having like these little movements where, where the parts aren't, overlapping too much and then i think i had some even some chalas like gling 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 you know just just when you layer it all up it was you know it's just trying to make it sound very clear and yeah. and not take up too much space because of course the idea is that it's a very wondrous experience flying around and you want people to be able to experience that and i mean i you know i will say that when i was at you know at at their studio and i was playing the game for the first time and hearing it with my music i mean maybe with music or without i mean as soon as i launched off i mean my, i definitely felt weak in the knees i was like well there's a 20% chance i might fall over right now <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird experience <laughs> with some of this VR stuff. And I don't, I don't know how people get used to it. And, um, and I don't know where that's going to go in the metaverse, but, <laughs> but we have time to, to figure these things out. The whole thing was an interesting experience and it was, it was fun writing music for it. So tell me, because you have had experience writing for nature documentaries, as, we've, as you've mentioned, and um, it's, it's there is something special about that type of music, right? So, uh, Absolutely. so talk talk about that. So you know, I always think it's it, it's an amazing. You know, it's funny because uh, some of the documentary stuff that I've watched or, or that I've worked on will be like tempt heavily with like Thomas Newman esque music or music can be like I mean a lot of times I guess if you think about you know like how it feels to be in nature some of it can be you know sort of fun and goofy like you know birds hopping around or or little insects are rolling over each other and but then there's of course like you know all the hunts and all this very scary stuff so so you have these like really dramatic things but at the same time um you know I was I think of it like it's it's almost like fantasy because of maybe the way that we perceive like nature we don't quite connect with it because we built you know human nature around ourselves but um, but at the same time, it's it's so grounded in nature. It's it doesn't really need to be twinkly or or you know it's not cartoon. It's very real. So so it's like this 
So the music needs to be very grounded. It needs to be very organic and it needs to be wondrous. And, and then it can be playful or fun or dangerous, um, sad or happy. It can still be all of those things. Cause I think those are things that the, we as, as humans and animals probably experienced, you know, I, I would suggest that they do anyway. So I think those are, that's maybe the, the general parameters of, of, of where you can start with, but certainly most of my experience, um, you know, listening to and you know writing uh, music for for documentaries has been you know based around the orchestra mostly but uh but I did work on a on a on a documentary film about the Los Angeles River and water rights and and sort of the flavor of how we dealt with that was was also in the same sense actually following the the protagonist of the film which so the music was also about that person but you know but we still recorded you know, even acoustic guitars and, uh, and, and some, uh, stringed instruments and stuff like that. But, uh, but, but definitely, you know, more in the line of like the work that I did on life and the discovery channel shows and, and the planet earth stuff. I mean, that's much more grounded in orchestra with some piano and then maybe some little, you know, sounds behind it and stuff. You know, in addition to all the amazing acoustic stuff, there was the electronic stuff that you mentioned. And you've got a really great video online that shows some of the the stuff you did. And one of my favorites was the dulcimer, where you took an Ebo. So you're going to need to explain what that is. I know that it's something that you do on a guitar that makes it all wiggly, but I... (laughs) So you take an Ebo and you put that on the dulcimer and it just sounds really cool, so... And Ebo is is a fascinating little instrument. I have no idea where it came from. It's probably worth researching, but it's basically just a magnet and it and when you put it close to a string <laughs> or something that can vibrate, it will naturally vibrate that that sound. So you can place it in different places. Uh and you, it can be a tuned sound, or you can probably place it like near where harmonics are, and do that. But it's it's a very it, you know again it's it's kind of a, another way to to work with organic material, but to create sounds that are maybe like unexpected or or, or difficult to place. So um, you know, so yeah, I mean, I you know, definitely I would suggest linking the video and and just and and it was you know yeah it was it was fascinating to to kind of go around and look at, you know, my studio and the different instruments that I have and, and just be like, well, what can I do with this? And, you know, and, and I mean, the most likely things were to, to find a bow for it and then play around with that, but then also work with something like this Ebo. I have friends who've, who've kind of turned me onto that over the years. And I've always kind of known about it because guitarists have, have been using it for a long time. It sounds really cool. It's, it's almost like that, a similar type of sound where, you know, where you can use like a volume pedal and kind of swell in. So people don't really hear the attack, but they just hear this, this ringing coming out of nowhere, just out of thin air. So, you know, a lot of this was, you know, spending a day or two in the studio, setting up microphones, you know, recording a lot of raw sounds and source sounds and, and then, and then going in either reversing them or lengthening them. Um, I had a lot of success taking some, some, some basic, you know, piano performances and then stretching them way out. And then it felt like it just created this, you know, this, the sound that could go on for for hours really. And you wouldn't really notice like, you know, it wouldn't become repetitive and it would still sound wondrous and interesting, but and most importantly, it was from an organic sound source. also really enjoyed all the bell sounds. I don't know if that was hand pan or what. There's a, a lot of, I mean, I just went through my library and found a lot of different samples of, of sounds that people have created using either different bells or different types of mallets or things like that. And, and there might have been, I know I, I had a little bit of like um, absinthe, which is a native instruments. Um, one of their, one of their uh, 
like samplers or well, it's kind of like a sampler and a synthesizer, like all in one, but you know, it was just trying, again, just trying to find sounds that, that sounded natural enough. And, and I think part of what, what motivated, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of these, you know, long sounds and, and, um, and sounds that I could really stretch out was the fact that, um, that we, we only could create about, you know, 30 to 40 minutes of music for this game. And, and originally it was going to be a much shorter game. And as the game got lengthened, I was trying to figure out ways to, um, you know, to, to make the score not feel repetitive, but get a lot more mileage out of it. So, so, so in the end, you know, I ended up creating like probably like over a hundred little snippets, you know, out of little, you know, sub mixes and stuff out of, the um, uh, stems and, you know, out, out of all the music that I'd created. And then they used uh, audio kinetics, you know, wise uh, middleware engine to create like a dynamic score that, that, you know, that could, uh, that could sort of replay the sounds, but in a way that, you know, you wouldn't know when it was happening. It didn't happen at the same time. Some sounds happen more often than others. And, uh, and yeah, I, I think it was really effective in the game. You know, you did mention there were other things that you bowed and plucked and you talked about piano earlier. So what uh, what is your main instrument? Because, well, yeah, just tell me about your musical background then. Well, my musical background probably started on piano when I was about six years. Well, I guess it started before that because my parents liked to sing a lot <laughs> and they <laughs> and they like to harmonize too. And it's really cheesy, but... Uh, but I'm okay with that now. And, uh, and but <laughs> I did take piano lessons starting when I was six and, uh, and later um, sang in, uh, in the San Francisco Boys Chorus at the time that I joined them when I was about nine years old. Uh, they, they were probably considered, you know, the behind the Vienna Boys Choir at the time, they were probably the second um, top, you know, boys choir in the, in the world. And, and it was, it was a pretty stringent experience, but it was a wonderful experience. Um, it got to perform with the opera and symphony and, and do a lot of different types of material and play a lot of concerts. And, and, you know, we would rehearse and I even went to summer camp where we would study uh, music theory and uh, musicianship and ear training. And that was, you know, that was part of our daily routine before just getting to be kids and, you know, run off in the forest and stuff and do activities. But, um, but so, and I think voice is, you know, was really important in my development of music. I mean, it's definitely where I don't use my voice a lot for music these days, but but it allowed me to hear music and, and think about music in my head, which which is really great. It's it's uh, I love coming up. I don't really have to come up. Melodies just happen. So so it's always good. But um, but but definitely as I started to gain more interest in in music as I got older, um, I picked up the guitar and that really became my main voice. I loved uh, rock bands really and, and playing solos and things like that. And I always thought of myself as a soloist and an improviser and later studied jazz and, and classical. <laughs> and, and then eventually, you know, eventually really film music kind of uh, got me excited. So um, that's been kind of where I came from. And then as I started to become more of a composer and start taking that more seriously, I realized that piano was was such an indispensable instrument. So, um, so I've I've definitely focused uh, very much so in the last like several years on on classical piano and and other styles of piano as well. But it really, I think, because you know, piano is 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 kind of like it's it's sort of the the gateway into you know <laughs> into writing music on a computer. Really, for most people, um, you know, it, it's 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 been uh, it, it's it's been really uh, useful to. To, to, to get as deep into, into performing and playing piano as I can. compose at the piano? Do you compose at the computer with the keyboard? How do you tend to compose? 
I do. I do. Um, I am actually going to get a piano soon and that will be interesting to see where that goes. But, uh, but I, but I compose at the piano. Um, there was a time a long time ago when I started all of this, I would actually sometimes draw notes in or play really basic piano in, and then everything was editing in inside, um, you know, my, my DAW editors. And that was a, a terribly excruciatingly long and slow process and very iterative, but, um, but since getting better at piano, I, it's, it's, it's much nicer now because I can literally play stuff and uh, play my ideas in and, um, and it, and it gets, you know, it gets things working pretty quickly. So, um, so yeah, I, I would say that I definitely sit at the, at the computer with a piano. I perform parts in and play around with tempo and, you know, start shaping things. And then I sort of build up from there, but, uh, but, but yeah, no, I think I work out melodies. Sometimes I, um, I'll actually write sort of a piano sketch. Um, other times depend, it just depends on the type of music. Sometimes the music I write is very sound design oriented. And then it becomes more about, you know, how am I going to create some kind of, um, sonic signature, um, you know, for better or for worse, so much music these days relies on that as opposed to a sweeping melody, but, um, but it's nice to be able to do both. You mentioned this, that the away score isn't exactly melodic in, in that way, but it still is just really gorgeous to listen to, and I've absolutely loved it. And oh, Thank you so you, you much. Know, you can find it on Bandcamp, and talk to me about the Audubon Society situation on there. So, you know, the more I thought about this, it just felt like it was maybe the right thing to do to, um, to you know, to, to actually, you know, put all of this to work a little bit more. And, um, you know, so I've decided to give 100% of the proceeds from album sales to, uh, to go to the National Audubon Society. Um, and they deal specifically with protecting birds um, and their habitats and education and that sort of thing. Um, and I've, I've always been a huge fan of birds when I was in university. Um, I, I, you know, I did a lot of bird watching and, and took courses. We traveled all over California and, and, um, and, and studied birds and their habitats. And it was, it was pretty fabulous experience. And, and it's kind of, you know, it, it sort of, it opened up my eyes to a lifetime of, of noticing birds around me and sort of appreciating them. Uh, we actually have, uh, hummingbirds here, you know, in our, in, in our yard and, you know, and warblers and other things. And so I feel lucky to, to have that, but, you know, if there's any way that I could give back, I mean, it's definitely, um, I, I definitely love the idea of like biodiversity and the idea of protecting, you know, animal species. I think that's uh, something that I'm really passionate about. Um, so, so, it, you know, for anybody who purchases the music, it'll, um, you know, the, those funds will go directly to the Audubon Society. do you want to say about the the game away um go out and play it it's it's i think it's a really great game it's a game uh, made for for kids and families and um and and i think it's a lot of fun and it was uh it was a labor of love that's for sure so i am i'm proud to be involved in it mike thanks so much it was really so nice to catch up with you again and uh we'll do it again soon hopefully wonderful thank you emily very always appreciate being on your show
Thanks for listening to Level with Emily Reese. You can learn more about Mike Rasnick and see a playlist at patreon.com slash level. I'm Emily Reese. Sam Keenan is our producer. Say hi, Sam. Hi. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Level with Emily and learn more about us at levelwithemily.com. Made possible by Adam Selvage at Tiki Web Services. Composer Brad Gentle does our YouTube channel. Level with Emily Reese is a production of June Media, Inc.